sure we want to open the floodgates just yet. I work with second year medical students and the particular chunk of their curriculum I'm responsible for is called a self-directed learning option. So these are particularly bright, usually highly motivated people who want to pursue a passion of their own and there's nothing in the curriculum letting them do it. So they submit a proposal to engage in a self-directed project. It's part of a course where there are also large plenary sessions run. So over 300 students show up, but some of them show up in Prince George, some of them show up in Victoria, and very soon a bunch more will show up in Kelowna. So you've got video conferencing going on all the time. The plenary may be from any one of those places. In fact, yesterday's plenary was from Prince George. We believe that those plenaries are considerably more valuable if the students have time to think about and more to the point talk to one another about the issues that are raised. In the course called Doctor, Patient and Society, issues like uh, harm reduction, domestic violence, complementary and alternative therapies, just to name a few topics, are, are key. And we want our students talking about those things. But our self-directed uh, project students aren't in a tutorial to do that. They go off and do their projects. So the question becomes, how do they communicate with each other to help construct meaning based on these impactful plenaries? So we set up an online forum for that. And the students said back, we hate this. We, of course, stipulated a certain number of postings. And we have somebody who reads them to make sure they have some depth. And students find this demeaning. And here's my favorite word, contrived. Oh, well, what would you rather do? Well, just let us talk about these things. We will if you get out of our way. There are hallways, you know. There are cafeterias. We do have time. And I say back, but how do I know you did it? And they say back, trust us. Interesting thought, really, isn't it? <laughs> so uh, these examples, these examples uh, I bring up for a number of reasons. First of all, I think they're varied. Secondly, they're extremely salient. Like your practice, this is day-to-day -day in mine. Day-to-day. -day. And I am not on the edge of technology. I am not an early adopter. But it's part of my life day in, day out. The other thing that I find fascinating, before we get into just some theories of change, is that these examples always push me to think about my practice and my students' learning in better ways than before these ideas came along. Even when I react rather um, violently against them, so to speak, <laughs> it still forces me to ask, as Tony would ask, why? What's the problem? What are you, there's something you value that you think you're going to lose. Have you ever articulated that before? Maybe not. So there by way of some examples for me. Uh, when Tony goes through some of the other examples, and there are far, far more, try to keep in mind how these things do a lovely job of rattling our educational cages and make us continue to think about who we are and why as educators. So. Um, here comes the psychological bit. I thought that uh, we could actually draw a little two by two table to help us understand the kinds of change that we might be talking about today. For example, there is that whole category of change that we choose. Remember that notion of control? I've chosen to change. I'm moving out of this apartment and I'm buying a house with a yard and I've chosen to live with the debt. That kind of change, as opposed to change that is, to quote Shakespeare, although he wasn't talking about change, he was talking about greatness, thrust upon us. I was just walking along minding my own business here on campus, and the next thing you know, I had to produce a website. Give me a break. Or as a colleague of mine once said back in the day, apparently we, were, we weren't working hard enough before. <laughs> hmm? Another two categories are uh, change related to moving into the world of learning technology. Now there are precious few people who are completely outside of the world of learning technology, maybe no one. 
And I've made the point that even though I don't consider myself deeply immersed, I see it every day. But I think we could probably place ourselves on, on a continuum where some of us do feel that we either have just recently or not yet jumped right in. Our discussions in the School of Population and Public Health about the DL, distance learning, make it clear. I've got lots of colleagues who would still see themselves as being on the outside and maybe someday moving in. Even though they, and they do email all the time, they tweet, they do all kinds of stuff, but in their teaching, what it means to them to be a teacher does not involve technology the way it will for some of you. So this means a significant movement through a portal into some other world compared to people who are already in that world and changes continue to occur once you're in the world. Some of these are nice and easy and great opportunities and some of them are what I have called version mania. <laughs> you just get it figured out and you're asked if you want to upgrade to 6.3. Hmm? Now when we look at the com possible combinations of choice, no choice, and outside looking in, inside dealing with regular, more, uh, I guess, smaller incremental changes, I think we can map out which are more difficult than others and some of the broad psychological issues related to each. For example, change thrust upon us, forcing us to make big moves, this is hard. This is the stuff where our colleagues say, I was perfectly happy. <laughs> Very effective as far as I was concerned. <laughs> and I think my students would agree. And now you're making me stand on my head. I didn't ask for this. This change will be very hard. Some of you in the room perhaps try to administrate or manage some of this change with colleagues. It's a ball of laughs. <laughs> Compared to this one where you're in, you're neatly immersed, and you just choose to make little changes along the way. You, s you see a presentation in Prezi, yeah. and you say, okay, caused a little nausea, but otherwise... <laughs> Otherwise, it was fascinating. I think I could create a Prezi presentation that actually did not yield vertigo in my audience. I am choosing to make a change because I know about presentation software. I enjoy it. It makes me better at what I do. I'm going to try Prezi and you go there. Well, that's a whole other world, isn't it? Uh, a completely different world. The other, um, it, what we like to call in our business the off diagonals are always fascinating. In this case, change that we choose but that moves us. So one day you wake up and say, okay, that's it. I've got to get something going on Blackboard for this course. I'm tired of students keeping coming up to me every term and saying, what's, what's the uh, URL? Um, or uh, have you put this stuff on Blackboard? I I'm tired of blinking back at them and saying, the U I'm, I am what? <laughs> And that's moderately hard. And this one, changes that are thrust upon us but that continue daily, those are, I would call them, annoying but manageable. This is the Vernon, uh, sort of version mania, I think. So when, you, when change comes along, take a moment to think about where it fits for you. Did you bring it on or did you not? And how big is the step that you're being expected uh, to make here? I'm going to take a moment to have us look very quickly at three very long-standing theories of change in psychology. In fact, these theories have been around long enough that we have metaphors in our lives that have come from these very theories. And language that we use on a daily basis that comes from these theories. Holmes and Ray identifying something that they call life change units. Measuring how stressful an environment is based on how much change is involved in it. The stages of change model by De Clemente and Pro, uh, Pro Sashka. Have I, I wonder if I've got an H out of place there. <coughs> Sorry. It's a slight dyslexic problem. Pro Shaska is the way that should be. At any rate, stages of change, sometimes given the $10 name, the trans theoretical model of change, uh, where we're told that we actually go through a series of stages as we try to manage change. And then one that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, the notion of what Rogers called diffusion of innovation, and the idea that there are actually types of people when it comes to change. Let's just take a quick look 
at each one of those <clears throat> and some of the implications for what we are uh, what we're talking about today. First of all, life change units. Have you seen a life change scale or life change unit scale? I think one right near the top that's worth something like 100 points, which is the most points Holmes and Ray assigned to anything, is getting married. <laughs> I think they put that higher than uh, death of a loved one. Just a, an interesting notion. My daughter's getting married in November. I haven't told her about that. <laughs> but the assumptions behind this is that a change isn't as good as a rest. <laughs> <laughs> And that all change is stressful to some degree. So if you look at the Holmes and Ray scale, they don't put valences on it. They don't say buying a new car. Well, that's, a, that's plus 50 points as opposed to crashing your car, which is minus 50 points. No, it's 50 points either way. Although I'm not sure if they're 50 points, frankly. But it doesn't matter. Even positive change is stressful. So even things that you look at in technology and say, hey, this could be really good. As you start to approach it, you may experience some of the psychological and physiological uh, reactions that we would call stress-related. A little fight or flight as we approach Blackboard. And the greater the change, the greater the stress. Uh, so those folks entering the, the world are going to deal with more stress than the people who are adapting to continual change once in. That's so straightforward, so simple. But as we work with people uh, who are resisting change, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that even if they're willing, even if they're hugely student-centered, even if they see the need, there will be a level of stress here and a level of apprehension. And I think we've all felt it to a certain extent, some more than others. Here's the stages of change model. Uh, oh, look at that. It's spelled even differently at the bottom. Now, that came in, Prochaska's name, that came in as part of a, a graphic. And I'm pretty sure that's spelled wrong. So it, we're all having trouble with his name, I guess, whoever that is. But we go back to 1998. For those of you who may have trouble reading white on yellow, uh, the, first, the first phase is at the top, or first stage is at the top, and it's called pre-contemplation. Some of you will know that the stages of change model was first introduced to help us understand uh, the challenges associated with quitting smoking. That was the first application here. And so De Clementi and others identified people who were smokers, and one reason why they weren't quitting was they weren't even thinking about quitting. They were just smokers. And then someone came along, maybe a physician, doing something that we call in the business motivational interviewing and said just casually, I see you're a smoker. Yes. Ever thought about stopping? That's the first seed that supposedly moves the person from pre-contemplation to contemplation. So this simple first step is, I'll think about it. Which for most people feels like, ah, oh, you're just putting me off, you won't think about it. But for the physician who's only got a 15 minute window, with a patient, I'll think about it. It's a big deal, actually. Because then you make a note of it and you follow up, and the next visit with that patient, you say, last time you were in, we talked a little bit about your smoking. You said you were going to think about quitting. Have you, have you given that any more thought? And that's how you push uh, gently the person or motivate the person to move down this list. So there are technologies out there that I am entirely, as these folks would say, pre-contemplative about. <laughs> One thing that I'm both interested in and a bit worried about today as Tony takes over the podium is these things are going to get blown up and I'm going to have to get contemplative. <laughs> this is one of the problems with Tony, as I told you before. He took a bunch of us at a meeting on uh, the creative uses of learning technologies and took a bunch of pre-contemplative, relatively happy, innocent people. <laughs> well, we varied in how happy we were, but anyway. <laughs> and made us contemplative. So we had to start thinking about the possibilities. Tony and his team produced a video that I shall never forget about a student who gets up in the morning and just starts talking to his computer and creating a program about the Georgia Basin. Remember that one, Tony? And uh, he was working with students around the province and maybe even another, in fact, indeed, other parts of the world. So he talked, with, he gave voice commands to his computer. He spoke to students via his computer from around the world. Uh, he did research that way. And then he got dressed. 
essentially, right? And then some of us, uh, this would be back about 2001, 2002. For some of us, this was unbelievable. We never thought that this was an option. So the next step is, 